The next two design patterns are the factory and singleton patterns. Suppose we allow the user to provide the textual input that specifies the test name, such as sign test. Based on the textual input, we create the corresponding test object and run the test. It's fairly easy to solve this problem, for instance, through a switch statement, but if you think about it, such solution violates the open-closed principle because you modify the existing code. The appropriate way is to create new objects at the so-called factory object. There is only one non-copyable instance of the factory object that is accessible from everywhere, hence the singleton pattern. XLW has its own factory class called ArgListFactory because all of the objects that it manufactures have constructors that take one parameter of type argument list. Note that none of the test objects have any data members, so the only role of dummy constructors such as this one is to make the object creatable at the argument list factory. Before the factory can start producing objects of a certain class, that class has to be registered with the factory. A special class called factory helper has a constructor whose sole purpose is the registration of new classes. For instance, that's how scientist object is registered with the factory. After registration, an object of type scientist can be created as follows. The factory returns a pointer to a brand new sign test object. Next, we are going to look into the usage of smart pointers that is closely related to the bridge pattern and the so-called rule of three. When the factory creates a new object, it returns a row pointer, that is, a pointer created through the operator new. Therefore, there is a definite danger of a memory leak as soon as that pointer goes out of scope. To avoid that, we take the raw pointer and use it to construct a smart pointer through another XLW's class called wrapper. Now, as soon as the smart test PTR is out of scope, we can be sure that the pointee is destroyed and there are no memory leaks. Another usage of the wrapper class is to implement the rule of three which sounds as follows. If for a certain class a user-defined destructor, copy constructor, or copy assignment operator is required, then all three of them must be implemented. For instance, such situation takes place when a class data member is a pointer to another object. By using the wrapper class, we can follow the rule automatically because the corresponding functionality is already implemented it's inside the wrapper. As a result, we can treat the smart pointer as if it were a data member of primitive type, and the rule of three becomes the rule of almost zero. Next, we're going to cover the virtual construction of objects. Is there a virtual constructor in C++? It's a very popular test question. The strict answer is no, because unlike the destructor, the C++ constructor can't be declared virtual. I got 98% on BrainBench C++ test, so you can trust me on that. However, the idea of constructing or copying an object of a known type can still be implemented. This can come handy in the following example. Suppose we create the object capital A of type new class, and then create another object B by invoking a copy constructor. Among other things, we'll have to copy the object that is pointed to by smart test PTR. To take advantage of polymorphism, we declared smart test PTR as a pointer to the abstract type P test, but in reality it points to a concrete object such as sign test. At compile time, we don't have that information, so we need to copy the pointee without knowing its exact type. This is implemented through the clone method that is declared as pure virtual in PE test and then implemented in 
uh, all three descendants in a very similar manner. For instance, here's its implementation in sign test. The next design principle we are going to cover is decoupling. Decoupling is a stronger version of encapsulation. Class A is decoupled from class B if uh, changes to A do not cause B to recompile. The absence of decoupling can significantly increase the compile time and also make you include a large number of rele irrelevant files to get rid of linker errors. Here you see the header file for the abstract class PE test. Let me ask you a question. Which headers must it contain? Since the overloaded function call operator is dependent on the class argument list, the simple and correct answer is that it needs the argument list header. However, there is a problem with this solution. Every time there is a change to arglist.h itself, or any file included by arglist.h, your own header file has to be recompiled. To decouple, remember that if there are no variables of type argument list and we don't call any argument list methods, we can get away with forward declaration. Function prototypes also fall into this category, so here we can switch to forward declaration as follows. I had to use the namespace trick here to get rid of uh, the ambiguity error. Here's a fragment from another header file. The prototype of sign test results is dependent on cell matrix and an E matrix. We can successfully decouple from cell matrix, but for an E matrix the forward declaration doesn't work. Because an E matrix is type deft, we do have to include the corresponding header mycontainers.h. An important question is how many classes should be put in one file. It's a good idea to keep abstract classes in separate files. For instance, this is a piece of source code for the sign test results function that is exported to Excel. To take advantage of polymorphism, the sign test object is referred to by a pointer that is declared as the pointer to the abstract class, pTest. Therefore, this module doesn't need a header for the class sign test at all. It only requires a header for PE test. The more abstract the class is, the less likely it is to generate redundant inclusions. Hence, by keeping PE test in a separate file, we maximize decoupling. Another rule is to split files when classes require quite different inclusions. In my case, the three concrete test classes require fairly different inclusions, and the situation is borderline. In the end, I decided against splitting and ended up with a single header and a single CPP file for all three descendants of PE test. So far, we have covered eight principles that have been used in the project. Now, let's look at the remaining four that we had no chance of implementing. For the strategy pattern, the idea is to set up a separate class to decide how part of an algorithm is implemented. Imagine that the test results can be presented in 20 different ways. In that case, it makes sense to create a special object that would be responsible for that and pass it as a parameter to the test object. In this project, we don't have this situation. The number of possible statistics that we can get from testing is limited, and I tried to get the maximal amount of information from each test anyway. The idea of decorator pattern is to extend the class functionality without changing the interface. The trick is to take a derived class and include an instance of base class into it as a data member. Professor Joshua used decorator to enhance the strategy pattern, but in this project we have no use for either. The engine pattern is about creating an abstract class that sets up a structure 
with methods and necessary data members that control all stages of a complex algorithm. This project is too simple for this pattern. It can be used if, for example, we decide to set up an engine for the screening of numerous trading strategies. In that case, a test object will be a data member of the engine. Finally, the iterator concept should be familiar to you from STL. I used a couple of STL vector objects in correlation tests, but I had no need to use any genetic algorithms that work on iterators. As you can see, even in this simple project, there is enough elbow room for efficient C++ design principles. Do use them in practice, because the nasty and sticky habit of writing quick and dirty code is not going to lead you anywhere. If you have any questions or comments, please contact me directly through email. I will provide a link to the project page in the video description so that you could download the final product in the source code. If you are interested in performance evaluation methodology, my website has a good collection of articles on the subject. Thank you for watching.